secfans.com. Stefan outside the SEC. That's right, Ohio State fans. Got a couple of SEC guys talking about you. I promise no SEC hating, hating on the Big Ten talk here. Uh, same with Big 12, TCU. We love you as well. Um, we try to step outside the SEC once a week, which means that you can subscribe to us and listen to what we've got to say. I promise you'll like it, and I promise you'll find us to be pretty pretty darn objective. Um, and and we are at this point, uh, you know, I'm going to toot our horn until we – you know, sort of fall off right now. We are 13 and three against the spread. I'm seven and one. Josh is six and two. And we get better as the season goes on because we use a computer model later down the line that combines a lot of data. Right now, we don't have a lot of data. It's week three. Uh, so we're really kind of going just from what we see in our gut. And so far, it's been pretty good. But we're talking about Ohio State. We're talking about TCU. We have no data because they have both been Cupcake City to open the season. Not so much Ohio State's fault. They can't help that they played an in-conference team who's a Cupcake every year. And they can't help that Oregon State, when they scheduled them, was better than they are now. I mean, they're just they're one of the worst teams in college football right now, have been for a couple of years. Um, not Ohio State's fault. Ohio State went out and handled their business, though, 77-31 against Oregon, 52-3 against Rutgers. Uh, TCU, Cupcake City. Uh, it really is uh, – there's no other way to put it. It's Cupcake City, and this is, to their credit, a big out-of-conference matchup, and we always praise Ohio State on this channel. Ohio State, Notre Dame, and USC, Southern Cal, are the best three teams in the country in scheduling out-of-conference. And Notre Dame doesn't have a conference, but they do still schedule really well. Um, so I want to talk about this game. And just for y'all, since you're outside of kind of, you know, listening to us every week, a lot of you Ohio State and, and TCU fans know we're a data-driven channel. Like I said, we have a computer model. We talk a lot of statistics. We talk a lot of numbers. Uh, it's not really money ball, but we do go from that perspective because there's a lot of people already talking about gut. And then there's Paul Feinbaum, who doesn't know anything about football. Uh, so we try to do a little bit of all of it. Um, all right. So I, I want to start with Ohio State and, and coming into the season, I made a prediction. I don't know if it's on, on video, but I did make a prediction that Haskins was going to win the Heisman. And I, I don't know that he's the best quarterback in the country. I don't know that he's the best quarterback in his conference. But I do know that, in my opinion, the thing, and I hope I don't offend Ohio State fans. Some will probably agree, some will disagree, because they love JT Barrett so much. JT Barrett is what Alabama fans saw in Jalen Hurts the last two years. In that, he's a wonderful athlete, and he's got a lot of records, won a lot of games, and he will get you 10 wins guaranteed every year because of the competition that faces and how good that style of quarterback and athlete is against average to below average defenses. He will not get you a national championship because, and I want you to go into that in terms of your, because they may not be familiar, kind of your sort of opinions and observations on that. Haskins is the type of quarterback that will, and we'll get into detail in a minute, but why don't you go a minute, minute and a half on the sort of the, the upside and the downside of having an offense and a quarterback like JT Barrett in the same vein that Alabama fans saw with Jalen Hurts. So I've had a long held theory that run spread quarterbacks and run spread offenses don't scale well. If you've got an offense that attacks the field horizontally, that rely, especially if you're relying on the run game, if you have an advantage you can be pretty dominant because you can move the ball effectively. If you can get six to eight yards per carry, you turn up first downs, you get a lot of drives, you move the ball, the other team starts really compromising themselves defensively, you're able to shoot over the top and get big chunk plays for touchdowns. And if you've got really, really good athletes, they make those chunk plays really easily or they can outrun guys. When you're playing average, maybe even if you're an Ohio State or an Alabama above average competition or below, defensively those teams can't react fast enough to what you're doing offensively. They can't, can't get to the edge fast enough to get into the lanes, to slow the quarterback down, to keep containment. 
things tend to get out of hand in those games. But the problem as defenses increase, it's the same issue with why this style of offense has not been successful long-term in the NFL whatsoever. Defenses react faster. They fill gaps faster. And a lot of what Myers' offense has been sort of predicated on over the years is getting one-on-one matchups and winning them. The problem is this assumption that you have a one-on-one matchup and that you have an opportunity to do something with it. And defenses have changed a little bit in how they operate. They've gotten smaller and faster. And the react the reality of it is when you run you know, a quarterback sweep, teams now attack the ball. They try to get in the backfield. And, you know, on a receiver screen, the difference in speed at an elite team versus a non-elite team is one or two steps. But that's the difference between the guy catching the ball and being able to run behind his blocker and get upfield and catching the ball and immediately getting hit, right? One or two steps is a big difference because, you know, if the guy's four yards away when I catch the ball, then I get the chance to catch, turn, and start moving. And if the guy's two yards away when I catch the ball, I get the chance to catch it, turn, and immediately hit. And and it seems kind of silly, but it's been the reality with it. So one of my long-term complaints, and we do do a computer model. We don't have the benefit of a massive database of data that some other people do, so our model can't be introduced until we get more current season data, which is around a week four. Um a lot of models out there don't account for how offenses scale. And I'm, I'm going to point a finger, a model that I love and a, from, you know, I have a lot of respect for Bill Connolly, but the S and P plus is a big model that gets referenced a lot in, in my opinion. And I think it's proven out that model has trouble identifying when you start playing elite competition, that the fact that you destroy a team that you can continually get the edge on. And I mean, destroy them at 13 yards a carry or something ridiculous has no translation to when you play Michigan whatsoever because you can't get the edge and all of a sudden that shuts down and you don't have a counter. Dwayne Haskins and guys that are better passers give you other opportunities because when you're throwing the ball down the field, when you have vertical routes, those routes are not designed on just creating a one-on-one opportunity and winning it or, or being able to get the edge or get your guy in space because there may not be space if the defense reacts quickly. Those plays are designed to exploit coverages in the way the NFL does, where you create separation. You create the positive play schematically and through execution in a pro-style offense, whereas a spread offense is not about creating an opening. It's about assuming the opening's there and taking advantage of it in an effective way. So, you know, we've we've long held that guys like JT Barrett, they will get you to 10 wins very, very readily because 10 teams on the schedule, 9 and 10 teams on the schedule, can't hang with you well enough to stop you when you put up a ton of points. Alabama set records with Jalen Hurts. They set a lot of offensive records last year with Jalen Hurts. And that was great up until the point that they actually played good defenses and they couldn't move the ball worth crap. Um, So a guy like Dwayne Haskins, that's a better passer. And by the way, 20 of 23 against Rutgers, that's hard to do against air. That gives you another dimension that will, in my opinion, translate much better against the better competition than the run first offense that they were running with JT Barrett. Although Tate Martell was 10 of 10. So maybe Rutgers defense is worse than air, but that's a different story. We have a whole theory about Rutgers and historically Maryland, maybe not this year that offends big 10 fans. So we won't talk about it. Um, TCU SMU, not a lot to glean from this really TCU this season because they play nobody. There's not a lot to glean from their schedule so far and their production. One of the things that scares me, and we talked about this a little bit with somebody that Ohio state fans are familiar with Joe Burrow has not produced against average teams, average defenses. So the one average defense or below average, what was it? Southeastern Louisiana that he played last week. He performed. Okay. He was like 10 of 20 for 151 yards, something like that. He performed okay. Um, I think it's safe to say SMU, the Mustangs don't have the best defense in the world. Sean Robinson comes into this game 15 of 28, 146 yards, 5.2 yards per attempt. For us, and I think you've already said this on another video, 7.5 yards is about where you want to be throughout the season as an average of showing baseline of competency. If we're looking for red flags for TCU in this game, you know, I think a lot of people will see 42 to 12, maybe didn't see the game and how ugly it was in the first half. 
um, and say, okay, TCU's got two blowout wins against two cupcakes. They're ranked about 15th. Um, this is a big game because they might win this game, and they absolutely might. But if you look just below the surface and you see Sean Robinson put up, again, 15 of 28, 146 yards passing, uh, 5.2 yards per attempt, one touchdown, one, t- one interception, is that a red flag to you? Are you scared? I am, and I'll give you another statistic that's really concerning, and that's uh, 80% passing, 9 yards per attempt, 461 yards. That was North Texas against Southern Methodist the week prior. So with what little data we have, SMU gave up 9 yards per attempt, over 400 yards passing one week to North Texas in a 46-23 loss, and then only gives up 5.2 yards per attempt to TCU? That's we don't have a lot of data. Maybe maybe it's a one off, but that's pretty darn concerning. That whatever you know, the one data point we have is that SM, it's not just that TCU isn't throwing the ball well; it's that they didn't throw the ball well against a team that got lit up through the air to North Texas. So I'm with you that if you look at the scores and sort of look at a cursory level with what TCU is doing. It looks like it's, you know, everything's fine. Uh, They're operating the way they should be, et cetera, et cetera. But 7.6 yards per attempt against Southern. Again, that's what we would consider to be competent as a season average. And they were not competent against SMU. Again, the rushing game by and large, 5.6 yards per carry uh, against Southern. That's, that's not really dominant by any means. And then in the SMU game, uh, again, 5.9 yards per carry. And I know they had better averages from their top backs, but I don't know. There's there's a lot of negative signs here that TCU may not be a terribly good offense. And that's coming against really, really poor competition. And the inverse of what we said about JT Barrett is true, um, or really what's at play for TCU is true. Sean Robinson is a good running quarterback, but the tendency, and we saw this again, I keep using Jalen Hurts because it's, I think it's analogous. Jalen Hurts would run for nine, 10 yards of carry on average defenses and be just like, look all world because he could run the ball. When people forced him, the LSUs, the Washingtons, Clemson's of the world forced him to throw the ball. That's where things got ugly. Now, you've got a TCU team that might be okay defensively, but Sean Robinson is going to have to throw the ball to beat Ohio State. Yeah, and I just flipped up last season. If you looked at – there was a stretch there from Fresno State really through the Tennessee game where Jalen Hurts was averaging 67 yards of carry and they looked great. Um, All of a sudden they get to LSU and he he runs for three yards of carry. So when you play better teams and you're that style of offense – you very much do kind of run off a cliff a little bit. I think Ohio State fans, from what I've seen in, on the internet, it seems like Ohio State fans understand this and they see it. And they were, I know, pretty frustrated at times with JT Barrett at the end of last year. Um, so, yeah, you, they're not going to be able to run the ball with Robinson and beat them with a running quarterback. You're going to have to throw. There were a lot of, being again, being SEC fans, we've used Jalen Hurts as an example because he's kind of, and the SEC, the poster child of a running quarterback that struggles against better teams throwing the ball. Um, Alabama also takes a lot of heat or had taken heat about their struggles with dual threat quarterbacks. But I think something that was missed, and we've talked about this a lot, the teams that beat Alabama that were those running quarterbacks also happen to be extremely good passers. You know, Cam Newton is an NFL throwing quarterback. Johnny Manziel is now an NFL rehab, but before then was <laughs> probably an NFL right, caliber passer. Right. Those guys, could, Sean Watson. yeah, those guys all, they were all really good passers and they were able to extend plays and that helped a lot dealing with the front, but it was their ability to throw the ball and put it down the field. If you cannot stretch a defense vertically, you cannot beat an elite defense period. And I think it's more than just stretching it vertically. It's the ability to make reads such that the defense, you know, the fact that you exploit coverages and the fact that, if you're making reads, there's no there's no way to completely cover a perfect quarterback because somebody has to be open in almost any scheme. There's always some weakness. 
Um, and if you have a run first quarterback, it is entirely possible, pretty much no matter how good he is, to shut down a run first quarterback if he can't throw the ball. So, yeah, no, I, I definitely think right now, looking at Haskins and Robinson and all the matchups here, you know, giving away my pick a little bit, but I have a hard time understanding why this is only a 13 point spread. All right. So, but if we're looking, and maybe, maybe I've got the answer for this, maybe not. We're looking at what Oregon State did against Ohio State. And I get it, first game of the season, Meyer's not there. They gave up 31 points to Oregon State. And I wouldn't necessarily care that much since Ohio State put up 77. But Oregon State was an offense last year that was absolutely inept. Absolutely inept. And and I, I think, was it Stanford that they, I mean, if they, they could have scored anything in the game. Yeah, they lost that game 15 to 14. Not a great offense last year, but quarterback in this game, 8.9 yards per attempt. Running back had 168 yards on 11 carries. Their top three running backs, here's their yards per carry, 15.3, 5.9, and 7.7. And I know this is what, and then this is something that Southern Cal fans said to us last week. Yes, we gave up 300 yards on the ground to UNLV, but a lot of it was on one play. And, and Artavis Pierce had an 80-yard run against Ohio State, but you take that away, and he still had 80-plus yards on 10 carries, right? And then you go down the line, 31-yard run from Jamar Jefferson, he had 47 overall. So what I'm I'm saying here is, you know, maybe there's something here and maybe this is why the line is where it is because they're seeing a little bit of a weak point in this Ohio State defense. Maybe there's nothing there and and maybe you're about to tell me that they gave up 31 because they scored 77 and if they needed to give up 9, they would have given up 9. Yeah, I wish I could say that so definitively, but frankly I can't. I- you know, Rutgers, Rutgers is not a good offense in general. They had 4.7 yards per carry against Texas State. It's not like they were ever any sort of test. Um, and that's not to say Oregon State is great. We don't really have a clue where they're at, frankly, offensively. Uh, but we know that the other, the fact that they were able to largely shut down Rutgers is not really indicative of anything. And maybe that Rutgers is really just that bad. And they have been in, in recent years. So, I think you're right. And and something we talk about a lot on this uh, in our shows has been trying to identify times where sometimes a spread doesn't seem to make sense. And more often than not, when we you look at a spread and you go, you know, why is that only 13 points or why is it only six? It's easy money. It ain't easy money. It, Vegas is pretty good at what they do. And they some most of the time and we don't bet we don't can we don't condone or promote betting there's a variety of reasons for it and a lot of it is the fact that Vegas is pretty darn good at what they're doing and and sometimes you know with trap bets i don't know if this is a trap bet but i i do think what you're flagging is probably what Vegas is seeing they're probably seeing the fact that TCU has a mobile quarterback the fact that Ohio State has struggled far more with the run than anyone would have expected to this point this season. I don't know that there's a clear answer on what that means or why, but, uh, you know, it, it's all new linebackers. So, you know, Ohio State may have a weakness there. It, it It's a lot of turnover really throughout the defense. And um, I don't know. I mean, you, you just because you're Ohio State does not, even as good as the talent is, did not necessarily mean you're going to be elite every way at every season. Sometimes there are glitches or hiccups. It happens to every team. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I still, yeah, I, I don't, I don't get it. And I don't, I'm, I'm trying to grasp for words to explain it. I can't explain why Ohio state struggled as much as it did against the run. I would want to argue that it's an aberration because the talent level is so high and talent definitely correlates more to defensive production than offensive production. The teams with the best talent are almost always the best defenses in the country. So I, I would want to say it's a one-off, but you know, maybe it's not. Yeah. And Ohio state fans, we're not killing your team. I mean, it was a 40 plus point win. It's not, it's not that you won or that you won big or that the game was ever in doubt. 
we're judging your team as a team that is in the national championship discussion. And that brings with it a completely different level of evaluation and nitpicking and trying to find faults. Because right now, these faults don't matter against Rutgers. They don't matter against Oregon State. But they might matter against TCU. They definitely will matter against Alabama. And that's not to say that you can't work those things out over the season. It's just, and we pick at Alabama and Auburn and all the SEC teams the same way that we pick at Ohio State because we judge them on a higher level. All right, there... For me, I think if this game happened in week nine and not week three, there'd be a lot more to discuss and we wouldn't be going. Really, I hate to say it, but with TCU's schedule so far, we're still going off of last year and preseason and don't have a lot of hard data to go off of. So I'm going to go ahead and give my pick. Um, as much as I said about the defense, I do think that Ohio State probably had a little bit of a letdown uh, against Oregon State just because it was hard to get up for them and they had all the turmoil going on inside the locker room off the field. Um, I think this is a kind of a statement game. I think Hatskins is going to go off and show why this Ohio State offense is absolutely scary now. Give me Ohio State 41. Give me TCU 17. Right. And I'm not too far off. I have it a little lower scoring, but I, I have Ohio State 34-10. There, there's a little bit of concern, actually a lot of concern with those, those run statistics. And it may be that there is a genuine problem there with Ohio State and run defense. Off the, But again, very small sample size we have. And TCU, for all we were ragging when the passing game, they were very effective running the ball, granted, against Southern Methodist University. But I, again, the whole thing to me is when you have the talent level that Ohio State has and you've got a team that doesn't look like they can really be two dimensional against a good defense, I tend to think that Ohio State is going to be able to attack the line of scrimmage and shut them down. And, you know, Bosa and those guys are going to be able to set the edge. They're not going to be scared of the passing game. So they're not going to try to get too far upfield, or at least they shouldn't. They're, they're just going to play their blocks, keep their lanes, keep the quarterback in the pocket. Um, I'm not super high on some of the secondary guys they've got back. I I think there's a lot of question marks with, for example, Sheffield. Um, we talked about that a lot last year that we felt like they were beatable through the air. I don't think it matters with TCU. There's a lot of signs their passing game isn't good enough to exploit it. So, yeah, I, give me 34-10. And like you said, I think Haskins, I think he's going to take off this year and he's going to make their offense a lot more dynamic than we've seen in several years at Ohio State. Uh, really dating back to 2014 when, oddly enough, Car JT Barrett, like we said, won those nine or ten games to get into the championship, and then Cardell Jan Jones took over, and he's the one that won the games against the elite teams because he's the one that could put the ball vertically. Yeah, and, and TCU fans, you know, we very much could be misreading your team because there's just not a lot of data to go on, and this is early in the year. Um, I didn't love how TCU finished down the stretch. We did the both – TCU Oklahoma games, uh, I think last year. And uh, but look, win this game TCU or have a good season TCU, and we'll talk about you again uh, in in your conference championship game uh, and, and in some other big games throughout the year. Um, Ohio State fans, also please remember subscribe to us. We talk about your team a lot. Uh, we are going to do the Penn State game in here in a couple of weeks, and by then we'll have a computer model. And our computer model did really well with Ohio State games last year. I think, I think the um, the Michigan game, it actually predicted uh, Michigan's uh, yards per attempt exactly to the hundredth. Uh, so anyway, that. That's a discussion for another day or never again because it's just too nerdy. Um, but y'all remember, uh, just go ahead and subscribe. Comment below. Give us your score predictions, TCU fans, too. Tell us why we're wrong. Tell us why we're dumb. Uh, but remember, so far, 13-3 and three against the spread. So just, just bring it. Just bring it with some data. And as long as you got data, we're going to engage you in the comments. Uh, thanks so much, y'all. Have a great week three, and God bless.